uh, where we don't have, I just got an alert on my thing, where we don't have um, mediators available or in instances where we have one side represented a mediator and an unrepresented party. These forums, and I know that the, some of the panelists are gonna go into it in a little bit, are so hyper-technical that one of the things the attorney of the day can do is to go through and make sure that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, because if they're not, it raises an immediate defense and may result in a dismissal um, that a bench officer who's, who may have looked at it and not have seen it right away may have overlooked. I also think that it's helpful in facilitating the conversations and the expectations and helping understand what the tenant can do to present to the court the steps that they've taken. Um, AB 832 has built into it now that if a tenant can show that they've applied for the assistance, the rental assistance, that they've submitted it and they're waiting, that the court shall prevent the forfeiture of the lease. But sometimes tenants don't know how to convey that or what to bring or how to show it. And I think the attorney of the day could be very helpful, even if they're just waiting out in the hallway, log on and have them do start doing the application right then and there. Um, but it is anticipated that there's going to be a great number of filings. And one thing that, that I'm anticipating is that some landlords are going to be so frustrated with the, the lack of funds that have come in and the delays that they're gonna be less likely to negotiate directly with the tenant. And I think having an attorney of the day there will be very, very helpful for that. Um, and then we were talking a little bit offline before we started about uh, possibly expanding to address defaults. Um, and how to address when, and when the court's getting default applications. But I think it can provide a very valuable service um, to have someone there, even if they aren't representing the attorney on a limit, I mean, the litigant on a limited scope, just to meet and confer and to assist in how to get them through a hearing, knowing what issues to raise. Um, because there's a lot of you who appear in court know that an unrepresented litigant doesn't know what the difference between what's personally relevant versus what's legally relevant. And I think that that would be an incredible support, not just to the court in helping to um, resolve cases early on and, and hopefully in a lot of dismissals, um, but also uh, really help the, the proceedings move more uh, smoothly and expeditiously with the managing of expectations. Um, and that's what I anticipate. I really do I really do see, however, a lot of frustration that's gonna be coming in the next few weeks where landlords, understandably to an extent, um, because a lot of people have compassion fatigue, are going to not want to deal with this. Um, and they're just going to want to start fresh, but they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater because they can get the money. It's just going to require time. And that's one of the things that we, I think having an attorney there who can talk to another attorney and, and sort of bring the temperature down would be really beneficial in the end and very, very helpful. Um, but I do anticipate seeing a, a large uptick in filings. I, I have a feeling that there are cases that are ready to go starting October 1, um, and then they're just going to start coming right in. So kind of what I'm also picking up from you is that the attorney that's doing pro bono work for the day does not have to be an expert in UD matters. No. They could be, their practice could be something else as long as they have some basic knowledge of UD which we will try to get to today, They're, they can just be as helpful as if, it, if they're in, in their own um, subject matter. Yeah, I, I think if, if we have people who are familiar enough with the forms that are required, because the forms are very specific. It's the, the UD 101, the landlord verification, if it's a default for rent, if it's um, 
everything has to be in a certain font size. It has to contain certain language. And all of this, if, if folks have that in front of them, sort of like a checklist and they've been familiarized themselves enough with the forms, it'll be easy to look at it and say, okay, I mean, and we're talking about the most basic of mistakes. If there's one box that's not checked on a UD 101, that's grounds for a dismissal. The legislature has made it very clear. They're, they're, these, these are very tenant favored laws and they want the folks seeking evictions to have everything done perfectly. And if there's not, it's not like a complaint where you can make leave to amend based on proof. This is just a straight up dismissal. You have to start all over again. Um, and so having someone who can walk through those forms and, and say, okay, this wasn't checked, you're good, or they failed to put the, you know, the, the Richmond, um, the language about the Richmond Tenant Act in there, whatever it is, it would be really, really helpful. Because again, you know, I'm gonna let you in on a secret. Bench officers were not perfect. Okay, yeah, and it's being recorded, I am aware. Um, but it, it, it's all part of the checks and balances that we have built into our system that we, we having that extra set of eyes can call an attention to something that a detail that may have been inadvertently overlooked. Um, and it also, I do think that it will result and maybe I'm being optimistic, but I do feel that having an attorney of the day there to go through the paperwork, because let's say for an example, a mistake is discovered then the landlord may say to themselves, okay, I'm gonna do the cost benefit analysis. Do I really wanna pursue this? Can we work out an agreement? What can we do here? Um, do I wanna start all over? So I think it will be really beneficial in resolving the majority of these cases. These are more, and I'm looking at this more for cases involving um, rent um, or, folks wanting to remove the, the home, like the no fault, wanting to take the rental property off the, the market. It'll be trickier on three-day notices to quit um, where there's some significant behavioral issues. Those I think will be harder. And those have been going on this whole time. First, they fell under the rubric of the public health and safety. And now it's incorporated into um, all the legislations, AB 3888, um, SB, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking on the SB number, and then AB 832. It's all been built into that. So that I don't, I, I feel having an attorney of the day for the three-day notices based on behavior will be helpful in hopefully working out agreements, is particularly if the behavior is egregious. But then there's also three-day notices for things that don't rise to the level, like renter's insurance and other silly stuff. So I, I, I think it will be helpful, but not as supportive for the rent, which has really been the crux of this whole um, issue. Um, one last quick question uh, before I open up to the, um, the panel. The, this program is being open to help any party that is not represented. That includes yes. tenants and landlords. Yes. Could you real quick address this misconception that people have of landlords that come into the court they have this image of slum landlords coming in. Um, yeah. So could you quickly talk about that? That What type of landlords do you see in court? The, the landlords that I have seen are typically landlords um, who this is an investment property or it's been a property that's been in their family for years. It's like a, a source of income and revenue for that family. Um, it's really their only source of independent income outside maybe what they make. And they're, uh, they're unrepresented. They, again, also don't know what to do. It's not, I mean, to be candid, there are occasions where we do get the unrepresented landlord who does not have things up to code. And, and that does happen on occasion. And there have been habitability issues. But for the most part, it's, this is someone's home that they purchased. They decided to rent it out and turn it into an income property and they had pulled some equity and bought another residence. So it's a source of retirement or it's just a net, an additional source of supplemental income. That's where we see it. Um, we're not, I'm not talking about like the, um, the person who owns like, you know, 12 properties in 
throughout the, the county and this is this is their life. They, these are usually single residents that they that they made a long-term investment in. I did have one unrepresented landlord that he and his family have owned this apartment building since the beginning of time. I mean, this is their whole livelihood. Um, and as such, they don't have a lot of uh, extra financial resources. Thank you, Judge Lee. Um, I'm going to turn to Mihela now to kind of give us an overview of unlawful detainer actions. And again, um, if you have questions or comments, please keep putting them in the chat and we will get to those at the end. Mihela. Hi, let me uh, try to share my screen. Um, let me try to figure this out. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go really quickly through just some basic UD timeline and what to look look at. Um, this can get really, really very detailed. And so I think what we're gonna do is just go through this really quickly and then just address um, your questions towards the end, um, since I think that's probably gonna be most helpful, especially because there's so, it's kind of like your choose your own adventure type of thing. So there's so many ways that everything can go. Um, so I'm gonna start. Um, so the eviction process overview for those that have not practiced um, an unlawful detainer. So just very quickly, uh, a tenant gets a notice, three day, 30 day, 60 day, 90 day, um, and to, to perform some kind of uh, requirement. And if they comply with the notice, um, the UD doesn't go forward and um, there's no issue. However, the, then the tenant, if the tenant doesn't comply, um, then the tenant receives an unlawful detainer, which, um, may also be served with a summons and complaint by someone working for the landlord or the landlord's attorney. And so if the tenant at that point has to file an answer, they have five, um, five court days that they need to, to file this answer by. Um, if they, let's go, if they do not file the answer, then the landlord can go to the court and ask for a court order allowing the landlord to request a sheriff to evict a tenant. Uh, at that point, the sheriff um, can post a notice on the tenant's home saying that they're gonna be evicted. And then they either get evicted on that day or the uh, tenant can request an extension through a stay of execution. So that's that side of the choose your own adventure. If the tenant does file an answer, um, that's mostly where um, you guys will get involved in. That Then, um, the notice, the landlord has to ask the court for a trial, a, a trial date. At that point, the trial um, notice will be sent out by the court to the tenant. It's about two weeks out. And uh, on that day, um, either a trial will happen, or if the, the tenant files a counter request for jury trial, then that trial date will be converted into an issue conference uh, just for negotiations. So a trial, if the tenant if the tenant wins, then they're ordered to pay uh, the back rent and they can stay and everything just gets reinstated. Whoops, oh, and now I don't know how to go back. Um, but if they don't, uh, then it goes back to the sheriff's notice and the sheriff uh, posts a notice to vacate uh, where they will evict the tenant or the tenant can ask for a short stay. So that was the, um, oh, there we go. That's the, just the overview, really quick uh, overview of the UD process. Um, currently, there are some local protections in Contra Costa County that are set to expire uh, just in the next week. So, um, but just, just for you all to have some information on that. Um, right now, a tenant is protected from no-fault evictions um, and and if a family member has to move in to live with them uh, during the pandemic, so they can't be evicted for unauthorized occupants. Um, they can be evicted for, like Judge Lee mentioned, health and safety reasons, uh, when the landlord or immediate family needs to move into the property or to remove the rental property from the market. Um, also, the landlords currently, um, they cannot raise the rent on properties with leases that were signed before March 2020. Um, but all of these, this protection in Contra Costa is going to go away as of October 1st. And so 
I, I'm, now I'm going through this really quickly, but I just want to make sure that we have um, a good chunk of time at the end um, to answer your questions. So I'm going to pass this on to Adam to just finish this presentation with the rest of the slides. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks, Michaela. Um, I, uh, I, as Michaela pointed out, this is um, a lot of information uh, very densely presented to you all. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and dive in. I, I, I do want to um, uh, just give a little little background. I, I, I'm, I'm the managing attorney at Bayer Legal Aid in Richmond. We serve very low income tenants. And um, in my experience, uh, these are folks that would otherwise not have uh, a representation and, and that there is um, uh, uh, data on the prevalence of representation amongst landlords and tenants and invariably uh, tenants tend to be uh, the unrepresented uh, party of, uh, I think it's around, um, uh, landlords tend to have representation around 90% of the time. and and. Uh, you know, it's just sort of in that context that I want to uh, uh, mention, uh, uh, I guess, move along with the, the rest of the presentation. Um, uh, because I, th I think some of these, you know, ABA 32 and, and the local protections uh, that are phasing out, are, I think are best understood as sort of, um, uh, there's different, there different timelines and one is winding down uh, that has been more protective of tenants. And we're entering a new phase where uh, rent is going to be due. And there's less process and less protection. And when we talk about an eviction cliff, what we're we're talking about is a lot of very low income and vulnerable communities that are going to be in in difficult positions. So that that's that's my perspective on um, uh, on this information and in, in the in the context that that my work exists in, and uh, that of my staff and, and uh, my colleagues. So. Uh, with that said, I, I, I also want to point out that mo most of the information I'm about to present is is relevant only to two rent evictions. Um, uh, we've already we've already named that um, health and safety nuisance stuff is going to be sort of on a on a different track and, and not um, a, one that's that um, uh, uh, you know been on, been ongoing for uh, the duration of, of of the pandemic. In fact, for the most part. Um, so AB 832, again, the, 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 the current phase we're in that's, that's going to be expiring next week, um, uh, provides protection uh, uh, to tenants who have experienced COVID-related loss of income. And uh, the way this process would work is that after a, uh, a notice to, um, uh, to pay or, or quit is received, they would have the opportunity then to uh, submit a declaration explaining that loss of income um and uh so long as they pay 25 percent of that total uh owed um then they would then be protected from uh eviction based on on that rent um and uh aba 32 also had the the i think the important uh, uh, uh limitation or, or i guess the expansion of some just cause protections uh, that exists under 1482 um, through September. And again, these are, are, are gonna be expiring. So we're gonna see different kinds of uh, no fault evictions that are gonna be allowed to proceed. Um, so again, this is in the framework of, of uh, uh, until, until September 30th. Um, where both landlords and tenants are eligible for relief in the amount of 100%. And um, uh, there is, uh, I want to point out that second bullet point that will, um, uh, is the portal for the rental assistance program, which is available to both landlords and tenants. It's the housing is key uh, website. And we're all working on, um, getting a, a like kind of a more local and concise uh, list of resources. But um, in the meantime, uh, housing is key is, is available and, and, and it is fairly comprehensive um, uh, as a resource, both for applications and for uh, uh, kind of a, a clearinghouse for where folks can find assistance if they need it. 
Um, eligible tenants, uh, again, can get 100% of uh, rent. And um, again, there's um, uh, mandates on, on uh, the turnaround of uh, time for the payment to be made to um, a landlord, their landlord. So um, up until September 30th, again, uh, I think um, up until now, uh, non-payment of rent notices have, have uh, been 15-day notices um, and uh, have been required to include this uh, hardship declaration uh, and information on ERAP. Um, and then starting as of October 1st, we're going back to three-day uh, notices to pay or quit, which is... Um, uh, a, a, a pretty significant uh, transition. And, um, uh, you know, for that reason, you know, it, 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 it shortens the window and, and we really wanna make sure that um, uh, tenants and landlord are aware of uh, the available rental assistance. And so um, I, I don't know that, uh, well, I mean, for, for one, um, uh, I know the court is going to be involved in, in providing some information once summons are issued. Uh, so we're all trying to figure out the best way to get that information more upstream uh, to both landlords and tenants in terms of available rental assistance. And then after October 1st is, is sort of this, this new phase. Um, uh, it does obligate uh, landlords to apply for ERAP. And the idea is that um, uh, that would be a prerequisite to uh, in, in, uh, applying for a summons, in fact. Um, and in which case, if and they would have to show that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the I think the judicial council is still working on on what that will look like. That is the how how does one demonstrate that they've applied for it? But that. Um, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but if once that is in place, that would be a, a requirement for uh, summons to to issue. Um, and and certainly in, in uh, before default is issued, there needs to be some mechanism in place to ensure that the um, uh, the landlord has uh, exhausted or, or at least fulfilled that requirement. Um, Otherwise, um, the landlord will um, right. So again, there's this the, there's this uh, associated documentation they would have to present um, uh, to support a, a, a default, to them before that the issuance of summons. And um, otherwise, uh, <laughs> so again, understood that this is a a, a really um, well, it's funny, it's both the high level and very dense uh, look at the unlawful detainer process and kind of zooming in on this uh, ABA 32 uh, framework, uh, which is uh, where we find ourselves. Uh, and meanwhile, trying to kind of touch broad strokes on the timeline and, and uh, general uh, unlawful detainer processes. So um, we, we really hope to have the opportunity to, to um, you know, provide further information or, or, or further support. Um, and I know a lot of folks um, on this call are interested in, in, in that. So I uh, really appreciate everyone's interest. Uh, the, 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 the last slide there was the um, uh, contact information for um, a lot of legal service, services organizations, including Bay Legal and Centro. Thank you, Adam. Uh, and I know Ritu has been so kind. She's been answering questions as they pop up. Um, before I turn to Ritu, I just want to kind of bring Samantha up as well. Um, Sam, first of all, thank you so much for heading this program on behalf of the Contra Costa County Pro Bono Committee. And um, Samantha has been instrumental in putting this program together and, and getting pro bono attorneys signed up. So first of all, thank you, Samantha. And now the, the work for you for today. Um, if you can kind of tell us a little bit about how you see this program and how people can sign up for it. Um, and before you do that, if you can give us a little background um, as for your work, how you got involved and as doing pro bono work and 
in, in how you think people can kind of get involved at this stage. Um, Sure. Well, I want to thank everyone. This is definitely a community effort to get this going. We've had a lot of um, help from a lot of people, and including Palvir and our panel of great speakers who are willing to take their time this afternoon and help us put this together because of the tsunami of cases that we expect to see once the moratorium is lifted. So I got involved in unlawful detainers um, doing pro bono work at the Elder Law Clinic where we represented elders who were the victims of uh, financial abuse. And what we found is that typically it was family members or known people that were abusing the elders and that were living in the homes with them. And while there's lots of nonprofits that were helping um, tenants, there were no nonprofits that were helping um, little old ladies or little old men who were victim being victimized in their homes. So because of that, I ended up having to learn evictions and were, um, was representing um, elders in evicting people who were abusive to them in their own home. And that's how I got involved in unlawful detainers. And since then, you know, I, I typically represent landlords, but I've also helped tenants. I think there's a huge need for help in this area of the law, especially now. Um, so we really appreciate your interest in coming out and today, not that you came out, but that you joined us today and that you're interested in volunteering in, in this program. So what we're envisioning that this program will be is, is like Judge Lee said and, and Pelvira have said, is having just an attorney of the day. Some people don't have access to attorneys or don't know where to look or, or don't even know how to apply for ERAP and they don't know where to go. So it's just basic general overview. We're not um, necessarily, we're not expecting anyone to represent um, litigants in trial, but maybe just prepare a litigant who may have a notice issue or a landlord who doesn't know how to start an ERAP program, or maybe even introducing them to the mediator and letting them know that there's someone here that may be able to help get the parties to an agreement without the need to litigate the case. Um, because there is so much law and there's so much information and everything is, is really technical, we know it's difficult. And, and truth be told, I don't know everything. And I don't know that anyone knows everything because it's we're learning it as we go. So it's all the more reason for us to work together and hopefully try and help some of these litigants come to a conclusion that, you know, there's some control over because when you give it to the judge, you never know what's going to happen. So the purpose today is to help encourage you to want to come volunteer. And if you do volunteer, we understand this is a very dense area. We plan to provide some written information and materials for you to help you guide a, a litigant in a, in a case. Um, if you want additional training, I welcome you to reach out to me um, and I'm happy to get you some resources regarding other trainings or other programs. Um, that you may want to watch or look at before you volunteer. But if you want to volunteer, we're going to go ahead and um, thank the Congress of Neutrals who has agreed to coordinate volunteer efforts for this Attorney of the Day program. And I'll put the email address of who you should contact if you're interested in volunteering more um, of the Attorney of the Day. Or if, like I said, if you want to reach out and just want to get more resource information about other trainings or other programs that you want to volunteer, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to um, hopefully get you connected to the right person or the right program to get you that additional information. And I, again, want to thank everybody on the panel and Pelvir um, and everybody who was involved in making this happen because it really is going to take our community to come together and, and help on this really important issue regarding housing. Thank you, Samantha. Um, I also wanted to point out a couple of things. One is you've heard um, mediation being mentioned a few times. If you're not familiar with this, in Contra Costa County, Congress of Neutrals, which is a nonprofit organization, provides free mediation in UD cases. Um, so there will be a mediator available that day at the, at the trial. And the mediator always tries to see if they can take most of the, the cases that are contested into mediation and see if they can resolve the case. So if there is an um, attorney on one side or both sides, it makes mediator's life much more easier because then they can take two or three cases into mediation um, and, and the attorneys can kind of go over the forms with the clients. So that really helps. Um, the other thing is that most of the cases that you will be helping with are going to be non-payment uh, of rent cases. They're not going to be, you know, complicated cases with habitability or discrimination 
or behavior issues. So you will be pretty much doing non-payment of rent cases. Um, if there are cases that, or, or clients that you, or litigants that you come across that have more complicated um, issues that you think they need outside help, at that point, um, you will have a resource list that you can refer those litigants to those organizations. Um, in fact, I'm sure I'll be calling Ritu saying, we got somebody and, and it's all yours and, and do something with that. Um, so nobody's going to throw you out there and, 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 and say, just represent these people uh, without any guardrails. So you will help, have help, you will have forms, you will have a resource list where you can send people. Um, so if you're thinking, if you're on the fence about, uh, do I even volunteer? I would suggest just sign up, go the first day, and I promise you, you will go back again. Um, that's how I ended up doing mediations in court. I went just for those three times and I'm still there until they kick me out. So um, you, you won't regret it. Um, in fact, uh, actually, before I forget, I, I heard this uh, statistic last week, and I'm sure, Rita, you'll have more information. It was that 20% of the cases in unlawful detainers end up in default. Can you kind of touch base on that, that why are such a high number in, in UD cases? Why do people let these cases go into default? Sure. Um, so first, hi, everyone. I'm Rithu. I work as a tenant's rights attorney in Santro. I can talk about this all day long. I will put my email in or reach out to me. If you have questions, presentations can be really boring. If you don't get to talk, please ask them. But to Pulvir's question around defaults, if you go back to that chart that Mihaela presented, basically it's like, okay, landlord complained. They filed the complaint, right? And then it's up to the tenant to answer. And if the tenant didn't answer, the landlord moves for entry of judgment. And it's called a default when the tenant didn't answer. And there are lots of reasons tenants don't answer, right? Sometimes things get lost in mailing. Sometimes they'll, the answer form is a judicial counsel form and they'll put the wrong name. They'll put the landlord's name instead of their name because they're copying the complaint. Sometimes it's in the wrong language. Sometimes nothing was actually served or there might be other protections. And so things end up in default because as you know, you're here in a legal training. Most people don't know how to do law <laughs> and they don't know how to fill out legal forms and they get really confused. And so um, there's a right to entry of judgment, but we wanna make sure that we're actually accommodating the reality of how normal individuals navigate the world. So this is an area that um, if you're interested, Centro and other organizations definitely want to provide training. How do you intervene in a default? How do you ensure a tenant who never even got the notice, who never got the paperwork, who had no idea how to fill out an answer, gets to say, hey, wait, no, I actually have some defenses. There's, there's a reason I should get to stay in my home and not be homeless um, on that side. On the other side, you know, around non-payment, as Holvier and other folks said, including Judge Lee, there's a requirement for landlords to fill out ERAP and it's to their benefit. If you're trying to evict someone for non-payment, you can eventually go after them in small claims court, but poor people just don't have the money. So you should get it from the emergency rental assistance program. So also in defaults, what we'll be seeing after October 1st is we'll actually, were all the procedural requirements followed? Did, did the landlord actually apply for ERAP? Were they denied? Did something go wrong with the application? Cause that serves the whole community, right? People get their money, but also it's really, really important, especially right now during the pandemic that people stay housed. So that's the brief overview of defaults. Um, and one other thing, if you can talk about what are the misconceptions that tenants that are not represented usually have of eviction um, uh, process and procedure, because many times I hear the term self-evict, or I will hear from people saying, landlord put this on my door and they're going to come and they're going to take all my stuff or, or throw my stuff on the, on the street while I'm at work. Um, and many times people don't want to get representation or are hesitant, whether it's because of their immigration status or whether they're scared about something else. So can you talk about what are the, the typical misconception that uh, the attorney of the day can come across if they, the tenant is present and they're trying to have a conversation with the tenant what are the, some of the roadblocks that they might face from the tenant saying, let me just leave. I don't want to talk to an attorney. I just want to do what the landlord's telling me to do. 
Yeah, so I think a lot of this comes from, you know, there's a big divide between who owns property and who doesn't as someone who rented for most of my life. Um, and I think a big part of it is like, oh, I'm gonna cause more trouble if I push back. If I just, the landlord's telling me what to do, so I should just do it and then this will go away. Also, um, tenants rights law and landlord tenant law is very statutory, right? So it's all based in state law. You have to know all these codes of civil procedure and health and safety. And honestly, most attorneys don't know that. So tenants don't know that they have any rights. And when you tell them they have rights, they're like, well, so why can't I just go up to the judge and say, this person's harassing me? And you're like, you can say that. We just have to file a motion to do that. And it's very frustrating because that doesn't make sense. Um, I will also say at least the tenants I work with, which are predominantly low income, people of color, undocumented, because Santhro can represent anyone, um, they faced a lot of harassment, right? And so they actually have had landlords literally come into their house without permission, take photos of things, say they're going to call the police, say they're going to call ICE. All these things are illegal, but there's no enforcement agency around tenants' rights. And it is very difficult. I mean, for the people I work with, it's not safe to call the police. The police also don't know these laws. So there, there's no way to, they just learn to sort of be like tense and hold it. And so once they get into court, they're really stressed out because often a lot of them, one, just imagine losing your home, like being told, hey, Friday, you have nowhere to go. The kind of stress people are under is so unimaginable for those who are not going through an eviction process. So one, people aren't always making decisions in the most thoughtful way because they're just like, how do I make this go away? How do I make this go away? But the other thing is if they've had a history of harassment or repairs that aren't done, right? Uh, like toilets that have been leaking for a month or areas of their house that have intense mold. Some of it is they don't really believe that there is any help. So they're just trying to figure out how to shut this down. The last thing I will say is I was a former public defender. A lot of tenants don't believe in free help, right? Um, they're not sure that it is free and a lot of them can't afford representation. And then the other concern is like, well, if it's free, are you any good? <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what you're doing. And you know, that's a valid question. Um, at least from the tenant side, folks need to ask those questions. And I think the answer for a pro bono or attorney of the day, a good response is, I, you know, I know how to do X and I can help you and I can connect you to a legal organization. And one of the most difficult things for tenants is often figuring out which legal organization to call because every organization does different things and then they call and then they don't get an appointment and then they're really stressed out and then they're like, forget it. I'm just gonna handle it on my own. I've handled everything else on my own. And I think we've all had moments like that. So when you see that frustration with a tenant, something we often offer is, you know, First, acknowledge the emotions that are happening because then you can really have the conversation. Most of you already know this, you do this with your own clients, but really acknowledge how stressed out people are and say, hey, I can help you with this. I can help you call a legal organization. I can help you put in an um, ERAP application and like really be specific. So I think that can be really helpful. Thank you, Vitu. Um, I, I think we have done the impossible that we covered so much in 45 minutes. Um, before I open it to the questions, I just want to go back to the panel um, and we'll start with Judge Lee that any advice for our pro bono attorneys or anything that they need to keep in mind or any last words on this. Well, first and foremost, anyone who's available and able, it is so greatly appreciated. And for those who can't but want to, we understand. I mean, the pandemic has affected everybody. So there's, you know, for those of you who who want to participate in your heart, but just know it's not possible. We just appreciate you even thinking about it. Um, I think the best thing I could tell anybody is just to follow up with some of these panelists on understanding what the forms are and what the legal obligations are. Um, and uh, uh, having that sort of down, a visit, we, we were talking about this offline, go to the housing is key website and check out what that application, the ERAP application actually looks like, because it's not as simple. I mean, we, Samantha and I were trying to do it on the phone the other day and bear in mind, I worked at Apple, right? So that some people are like, oh, you're super tech savvy. Not really, but um, even for us on Zoom, uh, 
who are getting more and more used to the, the technology, just looking at that form, what it requires and filling it, it's not that simple. Some of the language we were trying to figure it out, like how to figure out if we were locally funded or state funded is confusing. Um, and I could see people looking at that first screen going, well, I don't know. So I'm gonna, I don't know what to do. So I, I would just suggest checking it out. Um, you don't have to complete the whole application, but just to see what it looks like. Thank you. Mahalo? Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for having us and just reach out to us. And I really encourage people to seek out more training and just know that you are you don't have to <clears throat> represent clients as if they were your own. Um, even just having somebody there that's on your side, someone that's not like a neutral person, someone that is on your side and can help you with asking for a continuance, you know, getting um, the tenants in touch with the right organizations, um, filing the ERAP application, or just, you know, listening to the tenant and seeing if there's anything that they need help with that will make this go away or like buy them more time or get them the right help that they need. So not necessarily like doing too much legal work or like taking the case to trial or anything like that. So um, you're just basically going to be someone there as a voice for, for the tenant, as opposed to just the landlords who are 90% of them are represented. Um, and <clears throat> they have, they have attorneys that have been practicing for a long time. Thank you. Um, Adam, oh, there's Adam, this is hidden behind. Adam, any last words? Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just say briefly, I mean, I, I, my mind is certainly on what we're preparing for and expecting in terms of a, a really huge spike of, of evictions and that are gonna disproportionately impact low-income folks and communities of color. And um, there certainly is a need for 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 support and I know that can take a lot of different forms and then you know that um, a lot of the folks involved in, in this uh, presentation are, are trying to set up some uh, infrastructure for folks to plug into and, and that's that's very much needed um, uh, folks are also welcome to reach out to to me um, and my, my, my colleagues uh, here if they're interested in being more directly involved on sort of on the uh, tenant side and legal services aspect but um, I'll put my my email in the chat too, and I just want to say I, I really appreciate this this forum and, and everyone's hard work in, in putting this together and uh, in sort of a preparation of this this next phase, which which I'm afraid is going to be um, um, re really daunting uh, and going to have a huge impact in our community. Thank you, Adam. Um, there are days that I I hope that come December we all seem like we were the kids who, who cried wolf and, and the wolf never came, but somehow I doubt it. I, I am worried about that as well. Um, Samantha, uh, any last words? I think, um, I, I don't know if this is your guys' experience as well. I think that what's what been a little bit difficult as, as um, the landlord attorney is when I try and reach out to tenants to work out situations. And I'm frequently told I can't be evicted because of COVID. And they just think that just because these laws are in place that they don't, um, there's nothing that, that can be done to remove them from their houses. And I always encourage them to get some help because I, I wonder if that's some of the reason that people are not responding to unlawful detainers just because they think that they can't be evicted for that. So. I really appreciate anyone who'd be willing to come in and kind of just, you know, it's the law. It's it's just it's just telling them what the law is. And the code sections seem intimidating, but when you go through those definitions and you figure out what means what, it's a little bit easier. So I encourage everyone, um, as part of the materials, I'll be sure to hand out some of the, the law on this, but just take a look at it and, and just familiar, familiarize yourself with it and just help educate people on, on these laws and, and just be that warm body that could provide guidance is, is really what we're looking for in, in helping our community go through this, um, this difficult time. I, you know, as we transition into no moratorium, um, it really is gonna take a lot of us to step in and, and try and help people. So again, I encourage you to continue to learn, reach out and um, let's network to see if we can you know, help those in need. Thank you, Samantha.
Um, also, I think Samantha will put that uh, the package together, but in the meantime, if you can just look at the UD forms, if you don't have access to judicial counsel forms, just Google it, um, unlawful detainer forms, right? So just take a look at those forms and, and as attorneys, you'll have an easier time reading it, but still uh, look at it from a layperson's point of view that they are going through these forms. Um, so just look at those forms. Um, Ritu, I'll turn to you. If um, Do you have any questions that you need to answer in the chat? At this, I do. You, you? Yeah, I would love to hear if folks have questions. One thing I will say is I think we have all learned how important having a home is in the last year. I mean, I imagine we knew that before, but we really know it now. And if you want to do this, it's actually one of the most valuable things you can do for tenants, especially if you want to get trained in deeper ways. But people's homes are their lives right now, and it's the whole community's health. So, you know, really, really encourage you that if this is something that calls to you, there are ways to be trained, and it is intimidating. I don't actually want to downplay it. This is complicated, but there are things that can be done. Um, and yeah, and that's what I have to say, like, you know, everyone else join high pressure, but it has high value. It makes such a big difference in our communities, such a big difference. So I know we have some time left. If folks have questions, which you should, because nothing we said was super clear, ask if there are any confusing words or terms. Um, I'm also gonna put the link for, just so you can see what judicial council forms look like right now, they are likely to change in the next week but I'll put that link in the chat too. Perfect. And while you're either typing your question or finding your mute button, uh, what I've heard from attorneys many times is that it is, they don't want to take on unlawful detainer cases or volunteer because they think it's very draining that people are being evicted from their home and, and there's nothing they can do to help because they're gonna be evicted anyway there's still, even if somebody is at the end of the case is leaving their, their place, the rental place, there's still a lot of things that can be done. You can make sure that everything gets masked so it doesn't get on their, their reports. Uh, you can make sure that they can get into another property without having a negative um, indication on their credit report and things like that. So just leaving a property is not end for, for many of these these people. Many times they have benefits from other um, uh, nonprofit organizations that they will lose if there's an eviction on their record. So sh there's still a lot of things you can do to help. Um, so if you have a question at this point, I would invite you to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. And thank you, Ritu, for putting the link up on, for the Judicial Council forms. Can, can I ask a question? I don't know the answer to this. What if, what if there's a tenant and a landlord who have applied for ERAP and funds were paid out, but it didn't pay out through the end of the, till the end of September, can a tenant reapply for ERAP for the months that they did not have received, I guess, in the first package? I, yeah, my understanding is yes. It depends on which program, but because ERAP was divided between ERAP 1 and ERAP 2 and there was CARES funding involved, Often folks who got ERAP-1 funding, which they may not have gotten until recently, but it was through ERAP-1, are still eligible for ERAP-2 funding. Thank you. Because that's a question I don't, don't know the answer to. Um, and since we're asking question, I'll throw one out as well. Is there still money left in the ERAP program or is it all gone? And, you know, does anybody know? There's still money left. And in fact, um, so, there was a state auditor report that came out last week that basically says California needs to use up 65% of its funds to not lose it. And we have more requests in than the amount of funds we have. So we'll likely get, at this point, there's another 1.4 billion, I believe, but don't quote me on that number, um, that are supposed to come in as long as we use up our funds. So right now there is funding, right? Um, and, and people should apply. And that's for rent and utilities? Yes, it's for both. Thank you. I think in one of my clients' submission, it even helped them pay the unpaid security deposit. So it even went out a little bit further and, and cured that issue. Um, Carrie had a question. He said, uh, where is the ERAP form? 
and he cannot find actual form. And if Kerry cannot find it, we need to make it easier. Um, Ritu, you wanna take that? Yeah, I'm putting the link in the chat, but it's on the Housing is Key website. Um, I can't unfortunately stick like a matrix in there, but there are community organizations that are providing technical assistance. So actually helping people work through the form. It is hard, honestly, especially if you have low technology access, but I'll put the link in here. Um, we do suggest you try going through it yourself and see how that feels and kind of get a handle of the language just so you understand um, what what it's taking for people to apply and why sometimes it's the application process stops. And then Anna has a question. Is it possible that a tenant applies for EREP funds and only qualifies for a portion of back, back rent? It is possible. Right now, I have never, in Alameda County and Contra Costa County, I haven't heard of that happening. Um, it is possible because it depends on how many funds are left and they prioritize based on area median income. So those folks who are really living at and below the poverty level at extreme amounts are given first priority. So far, though, as far as I know, nobody has been denied the full amount they needed as long as they met the income eligibility requirements. And, and then do people need to figure out which pot the money's coming from? Or for example, if they're doing the application, do they need to know if it's the county or if it's the state or if it's the federal? Or is that all done at the same portal? Yeah, you don't, as a tenant or a landlord, you don't need to know where that money is coming from. It's coming. But <laughs> um, the Contra Costa County opted into the state program. And then the state program has both its own money and gets federal money. And then they're intermittent. So Contra Costa County is using, that's why the Housing is Key website is the website we're using versus if you were in Alameda County, they actually have their own county program. So it's a little bit different. We'll, we'll try to get all these emails and, and uh, links and everything compiled and sent to you guys with the materials. So if you're scrambling and copying and pasting, we'll, we'll, we'll get that all out to you. Perfect. Um, if we don't have any other questions, I would just like to thank everyone. On Gary's the got a question. Oh. He's politely raising his hand. Look at that. I cannot see Carrie. Hang on. Let me just do the gallery view. There's Carrie. Uh, Carrie, I, we couldn't leave without you having another question, Carrie. No, I just want to say uh, to mirror what Palavere said earlier <laughs> that tenants are often completely overwhelmed in this process. And even if you think you can't do anything to help them, a lot of times just them understanding what is going on helps them feel better. And at least they know where they are and where things are going. It's time and time again, you see people in court and unlawful detainer and their biggest obstacles, they just don't know what, where they are, what's happening and what the outcomes even possible are. So having somebody that can explain that, even if it's telling them it's not a good outcome, at least gives them some clarity and that can mean the world to them. So if you don't feel comfortable with it, just consider that you have a lot more information they do and can at least give them some guidance and some comfort. Yeah, exactly. And one other thing that I do want to, and I think I'd say this at, at every mediation training or this, we are very fortunate as attorneys. We have been, and I call it a bubble. We live in a bubble because we have education behind us. We have options. Many times when you meet people in court, they never had those options. It does not mean that they're not working, they're lazy, whatever. None of that is true. You will meet people that will show you pay stubs from three different jobs that they're doing but they're still in court because they were not able to pay the rent for that month or another month because something else happened. So if you think that oh, people are, are trying to run away from their obligations or, or something and that's why they're here, that is, that is rarely the, the situation. So people will, you'll be surprised and, and then you get mad that that's all you're getting paid for all these jobs. Um, but these are hardworking people that somehow end up in the system because something happened in their life that was not in their control. Um, and the other thing is when you do talk to people, 
and, and, and this is more for the mediators, but same applies for the attorney, pro bono attorneys. If you're trying to do a settlement agreement um, with your the, the client for the day and you're saying, hey, the landlord is just saying, start paying me $50 per week and they'll, they'll dismiss this, just go ahead and sign it as a good deal. Please be careful because $50 to us means nothing, but for somebody else, that means the difference between food for the family for the week versus you know, paying the rent. So be careful, just talk to the, the clients, talk to the litigants to make sure how they look at that $50 and where that's going to come from, right? Because we, we forget living in our bubbles, we forget what real struggle is like. So when somebody tells you, a litigant tells you that I cannot pay $50, take the word for it. Um, and many times people are embarrassed to talk about their, their financial situation. So at that point, expand on it a little bit and say, well, if you agree on 50 today and then you don't pay it next month, then eviction will be uh, will take effect and, and things like that. So, yes, so we kind of have to come out of our comfort level sometimes. Um, but thank you, Carrie, for, for that observation. And thank you to the panel. This was, you guys did the impossible. I, I just never thought we could do the overview of UD in, in an hour. And you guys absolutely did that. Thank you so much and thank you for your commitment. This is not the only meeting that I see you guys at. You guys have been working nonstop over the last few months, um, just trying to get ahead of what's coming. So really appreciate all the work that you guys are putting everywhere, not just Contra Costa, even in Alameda, uh, San Francisco. So you guys are, are, are truly, truly amazing. And thank you for all our would-be volunteers. We will see you in court um, as a pro bono attorney. <laughs> thank you so much.